you everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Vic. I'm the founder of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum and uh, very happy to have uh, online with us today uh, Javier Idiami from uh, Barcelona, who's going to talk about this uh, very, very interesting um, research work and uh, artistic project that uh, he and his team have actually been working on for quite some time. Uh, I came across uh, Javier's work sort of by accident. I was uh, searching on the internet a couple of weeks ago uh, about this notion of uh, image generation using neural networks, which is actually quite a well-known and quite a common kind of use of neural networks. Of course, I found lots and lots of examples on uh, generative adversarial networks. I found lots of examples on variational autoencoders. And then sort of nestled in between those uh, search results was this notion of lost landscapes. And so I went inside it and I said, well, it's not this and it's not that. So what is it? Uh, it was really fascinating as I started to discover all the phenomenal work that Javier and his team have done, where in fact, the output is the model itself, where they take those high dimensional model parameters and they pass them through a visualization layer and really create these haunting vistas. And it's fascinating. Some of those images are of cosmological scale. It almost looks like you're looking at a nebula or you're looking at some kind of a star cluster or you're looking at some kind of the surface of a, a foreign planet, alien planet far, far away. But then some of the other images look like they're microcrystalline type structures that you would see when you have a um, atomic scale uh, microscope. So fascinating, fascinating work and, and a bit different from our traditional sessions because I know typically we look at a lot of hands-on coding technology, but I think it's it's really an eye-opening kind of talk. So without further ado, I do want to uh, take this opportunity to welcome a very special guest to the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. Javier, I'm a big fan of your work and I know that uh, it's really growing in popularity. So uh, I don't want to take any more time. I think uh, our, our colleagues want to watch you and and hear from you and see all the amazing stuff you're doing. So take it away, Javier. Over to you, my friend. Thank you very much, Vic, uh, and thank you to uh, Synthetic Intelligence Group and to you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's really exciting to be with uh, you and the audience uh, today uh, to do this presentation. So let me activate the presentation. Let's see, and uh, let's see if you will be able to see the full screen. So are you are you looking at the first slide now? Yes, Javier. I can. Yes, see perfect. Person. So let's go for it. It's a pleasure to be with uh, all of you today for this Lost Landscape Project presentation. And we're going to do a very fascinating journey together. And this journey begins with us. It begins with human beings, with the Homo sapiens that from the beginning of history have been moving and exploring around three-dimensional space. Our space that has three dimensions. And, and if we fast forward, to the history of our world, and we arrive to the deep learning revolution, then what we see is that in the deep learning revolution, the researchers have embarked on this fascinating challenge, the challenge to visualize spaces that have millions of dimensions, even billions or trillions of dimensions. These beings that live in three-dimensional and operate and explore in three-dimensional space. And I invite you today to do this journey with me. This presentation is going to be a journey and adventure together as we explore this challenge of visualizing these spaces that have millions and billions of dimensions. And I have structured this presentation in two parts. In the first part, I want to give you the context, the why and the how of these visualizations, because this is very important to then jump onto a series of these pieces of these visualizations that are going to touch on many different topics, from learning rate, stress tests, to mode connectivity, morphology studies, ResNets, the library project, activation functions, the lottery ticket hypothesis, edge horizons, downfalls, dropout, Bayesian deep learning, GANs, geometric deep learning. And I will end up blessing all of you with the blessings of dimensionality. So let's begin this journey together. So before we go to explore many of these visualizations, as I'm telling you, we are first going to begin with the context, the why, and the how. So let's begin. The background of this project, this project really connects with a lot of what I've been doing for many years, a lot of my background, touching on the engineering side, the research, the creative direction, the artistic side, entrepreneurial side. And this challenge of visualizing these spaces 
made of millions and billions of dimensions in the last years has gone through an evolution uh, through one dimensional plots, 2D plots, 3D plots. And the purpose of this project is to take these visualizations onto greater and greater detail and also to explore their dynamics, to explore them in movement and also to look for new ways of presenting them in, in new creative and artistic ways as well. And it all begins with me and it all began for me with this paper, this paper of Tom Goldstein's team with Hao Li, Cheng Shu, Gavin Taylor, Christoph Stutter and Tom Goldstein, a paper presented in New Rips 2018 and written, I believe, in 2017, a revolutionary paper that took this kind of visualizations to a new greater level. I was very, very inspired by this paper and my engineer and researcher side wondered, can we take this into greater and greater detail? Can we take it into a larger exploration of the dynamics, uh, looking for more and more insights? And the creative uh, direction and artistic side wondered, can we also explore new ways of presenting and visualizing these uh, explorations? And the entrepreneurial side wondered, well, this is a crazy idea, so let's do it. All right, so I'm now going to give you quickly the context to understand how these visualizations are produced. So we have the neural networks, for example, convolutional networks that are classifying images with an input, with the inputs and the outputs. And in the layers of the network, we have all these millions and billions of weights and parameters. So these uh, functions, these, these functions that are mapping the inputs to the outputs depend on the data set and these parameters. And if we want to tweak, if we want to change these parameters with the backpropagation and gradient descent so that we gradually uh, uh, improve the performance of the network in the direction that we're interested in, we first need to be able to measure, to measure the performance of the network. And we measure that performance with a function that we call the loss function. And that loss function depends on the parameters of the network. And we have millions or billions of parameters. So it's a very, these are very high dimensional functions. And we can use a lot of different functions to uh, measure the performance of the network. For example, if we're doing a regression, we may be working with mean square error that penalizes the predictions that deviate a lot from the right values. If we are classifying images, we may be using cross entropy that penalizes a lot the predictions that are confident but wrong. If we are working with GANs, we may be dealing with, with this uh, minimax game between the generator and the discriminator as they try to minimize and maximize this function. If we are working with a Wasserstein gang, then we, we will see the generator and the critic try to maximize these uh, different functions. All in all, the loss function is trying not only to measure the performance of the network, but also to find the most efficient way to push those weights, those parameters, in the direction that takes us in the most efficient way to the objective that we have. And these visualizations, why are they so useful and important? Because when we find the performance of the network, we would like to know not just the performance in the point in which we are in weight space. It would be also great to understand what happens if we move a little bit to a different position in weight space. How is the geometry and the shape of that loss function? What is the structure of that loss function? Is it smooth? Is it chaotic? Is it a racked landscape? How is the distribution of the convexities and non-convexities of that uh, geometry? Because if we understand the structure of this loss function, we may be able to improve our optimization algorithms and our networks. And in this very important mission, numerical analysis and visualizations complement each other. They both attack this challenge from different perspectives. One of them more sequential, the other one more simultaneous. They both work at different levels of abstraction, always trying to understand in better ways the structure of the loss function. And understanding the geometry of this loss function is crucial because there are very important implications that relate that geometry 
to the performance of the networks. For example, if we use uh, stochastic gradient descent, SGD, in combination with small batch sizes, it's been shown that the minima that we reach tend to be wider and flatter. And this tends to correlate with better generalization. And the opposite may happen if we use the Adam optimizer and large batch sizes. For a while, there was a lot of controversy about this, you know, opinions back and forth. But there has been now experimental de demonstration about this. So we see here an example of how the geometry of a specific part of the lost landscape has direct implications on the performance of the network and its generalization capabilities. Now, all in all, we are dealing with very, very high dimensional spaces, spaces that we cannot visualize that we cannot understand. Spaces that are very cryptic for us, that are a puzzle for us. And this takes us to Flatland. Flatland. It seems very funny sometimes for us when we think of people living in two dimensional spaces that they, uh, they face very counterintuitive things. When things are changing in the three dimensional world, and they look very normal and continuous in the 3D world, but when they are observed from flatland, from the two-dimensional world, a lot of non-intuitive things happen. You see things appear and disappear. Well, the interesting thing is that as we deal ourselves from our three-dimensional world, with visualizing these super high dimensional spaces with millions and billions of dimensions, we are also gonna feel a bit as if we live in flatland because we're also gonna perceive a, a few and a lot of counterintuitive and non-intuitive things that we're gonna visualize. And we're gonna talk about a few of them during this presentation. All right, so when we train our networks, when we use stochastic gradient descent and we reach a solution, we reach a minima, we reach a point in weight space, a point, a combination of our parameters a point in weight space. And then what we want is we don't want to be blind, as we were saying. We want to be able to look around our position because we want to know not only the performance of the network, the loss value at that point in weight space. We want to know again, what happens if we move a little bit? Is it a smooth surface? Is it a rugged surface? Is it a chaotic surface? Because this will have very important implications, for example, for how the gradients correlated with the different mini batches. How is the distribution again of the convexities and non-convexities? May we uh, get stuck or trapped in some parts of the landscape? So we want to move around and we can move around in many different ways. For example, we can get to a point in weight space and then we can pick a random direction in high dimensional space. And we can interpolate from that point in weight space alongside that random direction. We can sample a few points, we can calculate the loss values, and we can do a plot. Or we can get to a couple of points in weight space. For example, one calculated with small batch size, another one with large batch size. And then we can do a linear interpolation between them. We can pick a few, sample a few points in that linear interpolation, calculate the loss values, and do a one dimensional plot. Or, as introduced by the wonderful paper of Tom Goldstein's uh, team, we can reach a point in weight space, then we can pick a couple of random directions, random orthogonal directions that make a plane, and we can slice the high dimensional space with that plane. We can position our point in weight space in the center of that plane, and then we can project that point alongside that plane. We can then sample, like in a grid, different points in the plane, calculate the loss values, and build a surface and a 3D plot. And this is used very much in the loss landscape project. Another thing that we have that we can do um, related to a wonderful paper by my friends of uh, NYU and MIT uh, is a mode connectivity. And we'll talk about this in one of the visualizations. That is finding connections, finding paths, finding routes that link different modes, different minima, while maintaining a very low loss value. That's mode connectivity, and we will explore it. And we can do many other things. We can do assembling. We can go to, we can reach different points in weight space and then average their predictions, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what, I, what, what we want to do. We want to move around and we can use different mathematical equations 
to do all of these interpolations and explore this wave space. Now, something that people ask sometimes is, all right, if you use a couple of random directions to create a plane to slice the high dimensional space, how do you know that two random directions in very high dimensional space are orthogonal to each other? And this connects with that flatland analogy again. Because in very high dimensional space, a lot of things are counterintuitive. And this is one of them. But we can understand it with a very simple analogy. In a one dimensional world, nothing orthogonal can exist. In a 2D world, orthogonal vectors, eh, perpendicular vectors, are going to form one dimensional lines. In our three dimensional world, if you pick a couple or, or, of orthogonal vectors, they are going to make a plane, a two dimensional plane. So in an n dimensional space, the subspace occupied by orthogonal vectors has a n minus 1 dimensionality. This means the greater the dimensionality of a space, the greater is the proportion of that space that is occupied by orthogonal vectors. And we can use the cosine similarity to calculate the angle between vectors. And in n dimensions, that's the square root of 2 divided by pn. And what this takes us finally is to see that in very high dimensionality, it is almost guaranteed that when you pick random directions, they are going to be orthogonal to each other. Another thing that people ask is, all right, you use random directions. What about using PCA directions, principal component analysis directions? And the answer is, you can use both. You can use all types of directions, but they serve for different purposes. For example, if you use PCA directions, you will be visualizing the part of the lost landscape that is the most optimized part. You will be visualizing the part that goes down the gradient that is very well behaved. And typically, you will not see all the richness of the landscape. You will not see the non-convexities. You will be focused on that very optimized part of the gradient down which you are going through. If you want to visualize all the richness of the landscape, then you use the random direction that will the, the, the random directions that will allow you to visualize the non-convexities and the convexities on the, of the landscape. Then you have a challenge. Because when you use random directions, however, you have an issue with the trajectory of SGD. Why? Because it's been shown that the trajectory of SGD exists in a very low dimensional subspace. And if you pick a random direction, based on what I said before, most likely it is going to be orthogonal to the very low dimensional subspace that includes the trajectory of SGD. So in summary, if you use PCA directions, you can capture the variation in the trajectory of SGD. You are visualizing the most optimized part of the landscape, but you cannot visualize all the richness, all the non-convexities and convexities of the landscape. If you do the opposite, if you do the random directions, which is what is mainly used in this project, then you visualize and you capture all the richness of the landscape, all the distribution of non-convexities and convexities, but you cannot, you cannot capture all the richness and variation of the trajectory. So this is the difference between both. Now, the next very important thing to say is that once you use the random directions, to do this projection and slice the high dimensional space, the next very, very important thing is to normalize and scale these random directions. And why is this so, so very important? All right, just imagine a minimizer that has weights that are much larger than one. And another minimizer, another network that has weights much smaller than one. And now you use a perturbation to project them with a unit of one. Now, that perturbation is going to affect, is going to impact much more the network that has very small weights. And when you create the visualizations, one visualization is going to look smoother and the other one is going to look rougher. But what you are seeing is not the intrinsic geometry. What you are seeing is the difference in scaling between the perturbation and the network. And this can cause a lot of problems. And this is all related also to the scale invariance property of the networks. Because in a typical convolutional network, when you use batch norm, for example, 
you could have two different networks with different magnitudes in the weights, but they could be completely equivalent in performance. They could be equivalent to each other because batch normalization is going to rescale everything. So it doesn't matter if the filter has a larger or smaller magnitude because batch normalization is going to rescale it, everything. So these two networks may actually be equivalent to each other. And yet in the visualization, they will look different because the uh, perturbation is not normalized. This can cause a lot of problems. In this slide, which is some uh, graphs from Tom Goldstein's uh, team uh, paper, uh, in which we see an example of the problems that this can create. For example, if you train a couple of networks, one with small batch size, one with large batch size, and then you interpolate between uh, these uh, points in weight space, and then you create a visualization, and you see that in the small batch size, you get like a flat wide minima, and in the large batch size, you get like a sharp minima, and then you increase the weight decay. When you increase the weight decay, you penalize and you, you're going to lower the size of the weights. But because the updates are going to happen more often in the case of the small batch sizes, the weights are going to go smaller in magnitude, more in the case of the small batch. And then when you do the visualization again, you will see that the minima of the small batch size case is going to get sharper than the other one. But again, you are not looking at the intrinsic geometry. You are looking at the problem of the uh, contrast in, in scaling, in magnitude, of the perturbation and the weights of the network. So in order to solve this, what has to be done is to normalize the random directions. And this can be done very easily. You can normalize by layer. You can normalize by filter. By filter works really well. And you just take the random direction. The random direction is like, it's just like a vector of the same size of the parameters of our network. And you take a filter in the random direction and you uh, scale it so that it has, uh, you normalize it so that it has the same magnitude of the equivalent filter in the original network. And you do this with uh, all the filters, et cetera, et cetera. And this doesn't only apply to convolutional networks. It also applies to fully connected networks uh, in a way that a convolutional layer would be equivalent. Sorry, a fully connected layer would be equivalent to a convolutional layer with a one times one output feature map and a filter would correspond to the weights that make a neuron. And that's it. Once you have normalized the random directions, now, yes, this is very important because now you will be watching the intrinsic geometry of these landscapes. And most importantly, most importantly, you will be able to compare different visualizations. So we move around weight space. We slice the high dimensional space. We do these dimensionality reductions. And this is the summary of it all. We go from these millions or billions of dimensions to do these dimensionality reductions. And a question that a lot of people ask then is, how useful are these visualizations and are they completely accurate? And we can answer this in two important ways. The first way is that Dimensionality reduction is happening all the time, right, in our lives. When we take a photograph of the 3D world onto a 2D sensor, when we are working with a very complex project with hundreds of parameters that we simplify to the most essential ones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the question is, are these dimensionality reduction versions a completely accurate representation of the original high dimensional spaces? No, of course not. But are these dimensionality reductions providing useful information that can take us to new insights? Yes, definitely yes. And we can actually demonstrate it. Oh, here are our friends of Flatlands, always around. We can actually demonstrate it by using numerical analysis. Because it has been demonstrated that the main curvatures of these dimensionality reduced representations are actually an average, a weighted average of the main curvatures of the full dimensional space. And we can actually use the second order derivative. We can actually use the Hessian matrix. We can actually use the eigenvalues. We can use the ratio of the extreme eigenvalues, of the minimum and maximum eigenvalues, to build heat maps to study the distribution of the convexities and non-convexities of the high dimensional space, and then compare those heat maps to our visualizations. And by doing this, we can demonstrate that yes, there is a correlation between the distribution of the non-convexities and convexities of these numerical analysis studies with our visualizations. 
And in summary, when we see non-convexities in these reduced dimensionality representations, it means that in the high dimensional space, there are no convexities. And when we see positive curvature, when we see convexities, it means that in the very high dimensional space, the positive curvatures, the convexities are dominant. All right? So, and that's all in summary. In summary, we apply all of these strategies to different architectures and changing and modifying different parameters. And now we arrive to the visualization part. And before we enter into the visualizations, I want to give, a, a, you know, I want to salute the great people of FastAI that were very important at the beginning of this project because working with lost landscapes is very complicated. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of computation. And at the beginning of the project, I had to do a lot of very agile experiments. And fast AI, the wonderful fast AI, was a wonderful help. Uh, and it's a wonderful help at all times. And is very much recommended by me always. All right, so let's start with the visualizations. And uh, let's go through each of them in turn. And what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is to, you know, give some comments on each of them. I want to go to quite a lot of them. And at the end, we will have time for questions, all right? So let's begin with the first one. The first one is learning rate stress tests. These are a series of studies. Let's put the sound a bit down. These are a series of studies in which what I'm doing is study the dynamics of the lost landscape. The way the lost landscape changes as the learning rate is modified in different schedules. And what I'm studying is the resiliency range of the networks in relation to the changes in learning rate. Because there are these resiliency ranges in which you can modify and allow the network to explore at different speeds without moving onto parts of the high dimensional space that uh, make the training process intractable. And uh, when you go beyond these resiliency ranges, you can reach parts of the high dimensional space in which uh, the process breaks completely and the low dimensional representation collapses completely. But these are a, this is one of the examples of a lot of studies that I have done with uh, following the dynamics of the lost landscape as the learning rate is modified. This is another example, Sentinel. I'm just gonna put the sound down. You can watch all these videos on the networks. Yeah. I can see that uh, because of the, the streaming, the, um, the videos are struggling a little bit to play. Uh, but anyway, they can, they can be found online, all of them, all right? So uh, this is another example of following a schedule of the learning rate and uh, studying the dynamics of the edge horizon of the landscape, the minima of the landscape, uh, the trajectory, the path, searching for the minima as the learning rate schedule is followed. All right. Okay, now we go to mode connectivity, a wonderful paper by my friends at NYU and MIT, Timur Garipov, Pavel is my love, Dimitri Podoprihin, Dimitri Vetrov, Andrew Gordon Wilson. This is a wonderful paper and very, very, very fascinating uh, related to, you know, it used to be thought that the minima uh, of neural networks were isolated from each other, that they were like isolated basins. And if you wanted to go from one to the other, you always had to go through an area of very, very high loss. But thanks to the work of these researchers and others, um, we have, um, they have found out that actually it's very, very easy to find connections that are not straight lines. They could be Vessier curves, polygonal paths that connect to different minima, maintaining a low loss value. And how do they do it? Well, what they do is they use a gradient descent um, to find different minima, different points in weight space. And you know, two points make a line three points make a plane. So they make a plane with three points in weight space. And then they take two of these points and they rotate this plane through all the dimensionality. And of course, you can do this in many different ways. So they pick a specific algorithm with a specific type of uh, uh, you know, path that they are, they are searching for, for example, a Bezier curve. And then they apply the algorithm until they find this, uh, this trajectory. Now let me put the sound off. All right, let's see if we can start to see the video. Yeah, 
So what is fascinating in this visualization is that what we see, going back to the flatland analogy, we see the boundary between the two minima kind of melt and go down until the two minima are connected. And when we see this, we have to remember the flatland analogy in the very high dimensional space where you can move in many different directions, as Jean Lecun said recently, uh, you are going to have all these ways of connecting the minima, but when we translate this to our flatland reality, to our low dimensional representation, what we see is this counterintuitive thing in which uh, we see the, the boundary between the minima like going down until the two minima are connected. Again, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, very related to the, um, the feeling that somebody in the flatland 2D world would have when watching uh, what happens in the 3D world. Uh, we have here a very high resolution representation of the same uh, situation in which we can see the contrast between the smoothness that connects the smooth morphology that connects the two minima and the rougher morphology in other parts of the landscape that have very high loss value. This is another artistic, artistic representation, all of this always using real data, always using real data. This is another representation uh, showing the the very rough morphology in areas that have higher loss value. And of course, this kind of rough morphology, uh, when the, the minimizer moves through this type of morphology, you can have problems problems of correlation of the gradients uh, of the mini batches, and this can complicate right, the training process. Uh, other views of these uh, extreme contrasts, a very beautiful view that we can also see in movement, although I see that the videos are kind of struggling a little bit, but yeah, okay, we can see it. All right, very good. Now, studies. We go to studies. What are studies? Studies are situations in which um, I will take a network and I will modify different parameters and uh, I will add dropout, I will uh, experiment with different batch sizes, I will mix very high learning rate with very small batch sizes, and I will uh, study and analyze the behavior of specific parts of the landscape while doing this. And this is very fascinating to see the different types of morphology that arise uh, with different combinations uh, from different perspectives. Uh, it's a really fascinating process, but it's a very complicated process. And by the way, this is, a, okay, I have here a video of an example with ResNets where we can see that yes, when you use skip connections with ResNets, you get a smoother landscape. And also when you study the dynamics, you can see the different behavior uh, in movement of the landscape as uh, you compare the non-skip connections and the better behavior of the network that has the skip connections. All right. Now, I was telling you that the, these comparisons are complicated, and a great example is in a recent paper the, called Pi Hessian Neural Networks Through the Lens of the Hessian by Zui Yao, Amir Golami, Kurt Kocher, and Michael Mahoney. And look what they say at the bottom of this paragraph. They say, in particular, we find that batch normalization does not necessarily make the lost landscape, the lost landscape smoother, especially for shallower networks. Why is this the way this is interesting? Because a, a lot of people think that batch normalization may make the lost land landscape smoother. But actually, what these researchers are, are finding out is the same thing that I have found in a lot of these studies that the impact on the lost landscape of many of these uh, parameters is dependent on the kind of network that you are using. So the, the depth of the network and different properties of the network is actually many times going to impact the, uh, uh, the effect that happens on the landscape by different parameters and different properties of these networks, which makes it all quite challenging. All right, this next is what I call, this is an ongoing project called the Lost Landscape Library. And this is uh, all using real data, but the, the interface that you're going to see in a minute uh, is still a prototype. And this is all about building like a library of lost landscapes where you will be able to see the impact of different parameters on the geometry of the lost functions. And you will be even able to estimate rough, rough predictions of the impact on the geometry of the landscape dependent on different properties of these networks. So this is an ongoing project. And uh, yeah, I call it the Lost Landscape Library. 
let's just watch a couple of more seconds of it. I see that it's struggling a little bit because of the streaming. All right, next. All right, another example of studies is the work that I'm doing with a wonderful deep learning research group, Landscape, Landscape with K. Uh, this group is full of very talented researchers like Diganta Misra, Federico Lois, Ajay Upili, Trikai Nalamada, Chris Akira, Jun Wei Liang, Himan Shuarora. And uh, we're doing side studies, studies like, for example, this recent one about MISH. MISH is a new kind of activation function uh, created by Diganta Misra. It's a non-monotonic smooth activation function that preserves some amount of the negative weights. Uh, so it improves the information propagation in the network. It, it's also more smooth. So, you know, we're working with the, with, with the team, uh, specifically in this uh, project with Ajay Upili, with the Diganta, Diganta Misra, Trikai Nalamada. Uh, comparing uh, the loss landscape uh, when using different activation functions. And in this case, for example, comparing Aurelio and MISH, uh, comparing the conditioning that the, the landscape of the MISH activation function uh, is better conditioned, uh, is more smooth, the landscape of Aurelio um, has a rougher morphology, uh, is less smooth as well. And we can extend this to other activation functions uh, like Swiss, for example, Swiss and MISH have a lot of similarities. Uh, but uh, we still find that in the landscapes, um, the MISH landscape is uh, still slightly better conditioned. Uh, it has slightly more smoothness. Uh, the Swiss also has issues of gradient collapse with very deep networks. And, you know, we do these studies in which we analyze and compare uh, different, different landscapes in relation to different parameters. All right, now we arrive to the lottery garden. Welcome to the lottery garden, everybody. Yes. What is the Lottery Garden? Well, the Lottery Garden is related to a wonderful paper called the Lottery Ticket Hypothesis by Jonathan Frankel and Michael Carvin. And as you probably know, this is about training with SGD, reaching a good solution, a good minima, and then pruning the weights of the network with different strategies. The strategies that I have used in my visualizations are the strategies of taking the weights that are the smallest ones and begin to prune them. This is a very typical strategy because the concept is that the, the weights that are the, they have the largest magnitude are the ones that probably contribute the most to, to the performance of the network. So we gradually prune and get rid of more and more weights of the network. And the amazing thing, and we're going to see it in the visualizations, all of these are lost landscapes created with the real data of this pruning process. And this, um, this planes that you see below the landscapes, they are in the position of the best loss value reached by the original network on the test data set. So if you look from right to left, this is 0.04% of the weights pruned, then 20%, 35%, 48%, 59% of the weights pruned. And the parts of the landscapes that are breaking through the plane are landscapes that not only are equal in the performance of the original network, they are actually exceeding it. They are even, even pruning 50 or 60% of the weights, they are reaching a better performance. They are generalizing better than the original network, which is incredible. And by the way, the six uh, landscapes on each uh, column, uh, they represent six epochs, okay? So basically I'm running six epochs, six epochs, six epochs at different pruning levels. Now, up to 80%, the lost landscape is very well behaved, is very smooth, and is very similar to the lost landscape of the original network. Between 80 and 90% of the pruning, the lost landscapes begin to uh, get more rough, begins to degrade. And after you reach in the high 90, 90%, 95%, 98%, uh, it eventually goes to a, a situation in which uh, in high dimensional space, the network is completely unable with such few weights uh, to find a path of convergence. Here we have a detailed representation. You can see how up to 75%, the lost landscape is very similar to the original one. And it, in many occasions, it exceeds the performance of the original one. Up to 80%, it reaches or exceeds the performance between 80 and 90%. It begins to lose contact with the original performance. It begins to be unable to uh, go deep down to a, a good minima. And uh, finally, after you pass 95%, eventually you reach that point of collapse in which the whole training process completely breaks down. 
in this visualization. To the left is more pruning. You can see that the lost landscape is very well behaved until eventually it begins to flatten down. And in this horizontal representation, these fuchsia circles represent those winning lottery tickets where you exceed the performance or equal the performance of the original network and how horizontally eh, begins to flatten out, begins to be unable to tunnel towards a good solution until it completely collapses. And here we have a video with a very fun music. Yes, lottery ticket or 20% winning ticket. 35% winning ticket as well. 50%, there we have. Congratulations, another winning ticket. And even at 73%, we have another winning ticket. And at 80% as well. But now it starts to lose. Oh, I'm sorry, my friend. No more winning tickets for you. Please don't collapse, okay? Don't collapse. Make me that favor, all right? But I'm afraid it's going to collapse. We're already in 95% of pruning. And um, eventually, uh, it will be unable to find in very high dimensional space a path of convergence to good minima, and it will completely collapse. I'm very sorry you collapsed. Better luck next time, my friend. All right. Next point is the edge horizon. What does it mean, the edge horizon? Well, when I've been working with lost landscapes now for a very long time, I have been giving names to different parts of these landscapes that are very interesting for me to explore. And I call the edge horizon to the area of transition to the main convexity of the landscape. And I call the downfall to the area that goes from the edge horizon to the minima. And then we have the minima. And you know, the geometry, the size, the flatness, the width, the roughness, the smoothness, etc., of the edge horizon, of the downfall, and of the minima have very important implications and very important potential source of insights in relation to our networks. So in this visualization, you can see a very high resolution visualization of the approach to an edge horizon in very extreme resolution where we can see a lot of details of the morphology of the approach to this edge horizon. I can see that the video is struggling a little bit, but yes, that's it. These are static views of the same. This is another visualization called Gently. Let me see if I can lower a little bit sound here, yes. Okay. So in this visualization, again, when you watch these videos online, you, you will see them very smoothly. So in this visualization, we are following again the training process of a network as it begins to find a path to the minima. Going back to the flatland analogy, it's very interesting in the visualizations how many times we see that there is um, almost like a flat surface, and it begins to tunnel down towards the minima. So you have to remember again the analogy with flatland. What uh, in the very high dimensional spaces is going to be a continuous connection in many different directions that link the different minima, when we do the dimensionality reduction to our flatland reality, for us it's going to look like things appear and disappear, like this this tunneling happens, like these, these gaps, these holes appear towards the minima, like the boundaries melt between the minima. This is our flatland reality. This visualization explores, by the way, um, the bottom part of the minima. All right? And this one is called Peace, okay? And it's a visualization that explores an approach in high resolution to a minima, as well as uh, the downfall and the bottom part. This is a very high resolution representation of a downfall between an edge horizon and a minima with a very detailed morphology. Uh, this is again what I was telling you before. This is the very counterintuitive um, low dimensionality representation of the process of tunneling and opening the path towards the minima. Very, very fascinating. Goblin. Goblin, let's lower the sound, yes. Goblin is starting from the top of an edge horizon and then going down the downfall and exploring the minima. This is really fascinating. I mean, for me, it's just like, this is just like a passion, you know? I mean, to think, and now we're going to go to drop out. That is fascinating. But if you think about it, you know, in our lifetimes, we will not be able to visit other galaxies, maybe. 
and we will not be able to understand or watch or visualize a, a million dimensional spaces, but we have tools. We have tools to explore them. This is extraordinary. We have tools to explore the galaxies that we cannot visit. And we have tools to explore million dimensional spaces that are totally beyond our reach. So dropout, as we add the dropout to our networks, this very distinctive noise layer begins to take over the lost landscape. And the intuition is very beautiful and very clear, right? As we know about dropout, that dropout gives us this homogeneous dynamic noise layer that is disruptive enough to prevent the network from memorizing the movements around weight space from overfitting too much, but is not disruptive enough to prevent the network from converging to a good minimum. Unless we increase the dropout so much that we completely overtake the entire landscape with this noise layer. And in this visualization, there are a couple of visualizations in this presentation. That is the first time that I show, this is one of them. Uh, the library was another one, the ticket as well. So we can see how we gradually add dropout and this noise layer gradually takes over the landscape. As we gradually increase the dropout, and you can see that when you are in a point in weight space and you move a little bit to the side, this, this noise layer is gonna keep you on your toes. It's gonna help you with generalization. All right, now we go to Bayesian deep learning. Bayesian deep learning, a paper, wonderful paper by, again, the friends of NYU, MIT, Wesley Maddox, Timur Garipov, Pavel Zmailov, Dmitry Vetrov, Andrew Gordon Wilson. And Bayesian deep learning is all about dealing with uncertainty. If we don't deal with uncertainty in deep learning, we may do overconfident predictions. So what these uh, wonderful researchers try to do is to create a probability distribution of the weights of the network that they call the posterior. But creating such distribution is very complicated. It's intractable. So instead, they approximate it. And to approximate it, they use the trajectory of a stochastic gradient descent. So they train a network, they, got, they get to a good solution, to a good minima, and then they use a high learning rate to move around and capture other solutions that explain well the training data, but do different predictions on the test data. And then with all of those solutions, they build a Gaussian probability distribution, and they demonstrate that this Gaussian probability distribution explains very well the geometry of the posterior, which is the lost landscape. And in this series of visualizations, at a series of visualizations, we see the real position of the real solutions on the lost landscape of uh, their experiments and the positions on the Gaussian distributions that they create, all right? And well, we have other visualizations and we have static views you know, of these explorations. Okay, now we go on to GANs, the wild networks. Well, you know what is the problem with GANs, right? That the original GANs had, uh, have a loss function that doesn't correlate well with the performance of the network. It doesn't correlate well with the quality of the images. So we get to this other type of GANs, the Wasserstein gradient penalty GANs. These use a completely different type of loss function that is based on the Earth's mover distance or Wasserstein's distance, that is the shortest average distance needed to move a probability mass from a distribution to another. And this loss function, yes, it correlates much better with the performance of the network and with the quality of the results of the images. And in this experiment, in these visualizations, I'm using the Saliba data set. And by the way, the, the way they do this in the Wasserstein gang, they put some constraints, the one Lipschitz constraint on the network, and you can do, you know, get to these constraints. You can clip the weights, but this causes side effects. So finally, what they do is a soft constraints in the gradient of the critic. Basically, they, they, they add a new term to the loss function uh, so that the L2 norm of the gradient of the critics is uh, close to one. And then just then we can explore the lost landscape of the generator of the gang. And it's very, very interesting because what we find when we analyze the lost landscape of the generator of the gang in this specific case with the Saliba data set is that we really perceive the more uh, the wilder nature of these networks. They are much more dynamic. They have this very dynamic, uh, this, this variation and this... Um, Harder, harder to tame behavior, you know? 
And uh, really, it's a field in which I am very, very interested in all the research that has been done to try to prevent all the, you know, all the collapses uh, and all the issues that the, the, this type of networks uh, have been dealing with. All right, geometric deep learning. This is just to tell you that this project began completely focused on the lost landscapes and is spreading to other areas as well. This is a collaboration with a company from Switzerland called Neural Concept SA, uh, with their wonderful team with Pierre Baquet, Lucas Zampieri, and Artem Shevchenko, in which is very interesting. We are uh, working with a geometric convolutional network, and what we're visualizing in this representation lower sound, so is this geometric convolutional network is predicting the aerodynamic properties of an aircraft, aerodynamic, aerodynamic properties of an aircraft, of a drone. And the numbers that you see is the predictions of the network, that is the pressure exerted by the air on different parts of the drone. And the colors are the features that are being learned by the filters of the geometric convolutional network. So in the same way that with traditional convolutional networks, we can see the features being learned by the filters in 2D planes. Here we are seeing them mapped onto a 3D surface because these are geometrical convolutional networks. Really, really interesting and really, really fascinating. And finally, approaching to the end, my friends, I want to end talking about the blessing of dimensionality. Because a lot of my work and my explorations on this project have taken me to really feel this blessing of dimensionality concept. For a long time, people have spoken about the cursing of dimensionality, that very high dimensional spaces introduce a lot of issues and challenges. But we are finding more and more that the very high dimensional spaces also have a lot of blessings and advantages. And there is a wonderful talk by Babak Hasibi called Deep Learning and the Blessing of Dimensionality that I highly recommend, in which Babak gives a wonderful analogy. Speaking of networks that are well initialized and well designed, he says that finding a good minima becomes a local problem. Instead of looking for a needle in a haystack, it is as if we were looking, as if we were exploring a haystack full of needles. And finding a minima becomes a local problem. You always have one of them nearby. This has been very emphasized as well for another, by another wonderful paper called Deep Ensembles, a Lost Landscape Perspective by Stanislav Fort, Hui Hu, and Balaji Lakshminarajanan. In which uh, is a really fascinating paper in which they say when you do random initializations of a network, they demonstrate that you reach and they also do a very interesting comparison with Bayesian and deep learning. But anyway, you do different random initializations, you reach different minima that are truly different. They, have, they can have equivalent performance, but they are truly different parts of the high dimensional space. They are truly different solutions, different minima, completely qualitatively different to each other. Again, it's as if when we have a good initialization, we can almost pick and choose. We always have a challenge. The challenge of finding the local minima becomes a local problem. And that's it. Just to complete the reminder to always have in mind this flatland analogy and to appreciate the wonderful challenge that it is for us to face these super high dimensional spaces with millions, billions, and now very soon trillions of dimensions and the luxury that it is to have tools to explore and learn from these spaces and to deal and interpret the counterintuitive and no intuitive things that we perceive through them, these wonderful, wonderful mysteries. Thank you very much. And we can go to the questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Javier. That was a very interesting presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, and I have a number of comments and questions. We'll quickly go to some of the questions that are coming in. Uh, yes. So one of the things I found fascinating was when you talked about the uh, eigenvalues test. I found that slide very fascinating when you talked about the principal curvature of the dimensionality reduced plot with the Gaussian mm -hmm. distribution actually is the weighted average of the uh, principal curvature of the full dimensional 
uh, surface. Uh, and right. some level, uh, Javier, you know, it seems almost intuitive. You would think that given the techniques you described, that would be the case. But to actually see it empirically tested and validated and visualized, uh, to me, that was fascinating. So were there other similar insights that you sort of knew were intuitive, but the visualization really helped bring it to the surface? Well, I mean, there are there are a lot of them. There are many insights related to the to, you know to the behavior of the networks in relation to the morphology, like the smoothness and the or you know like the ruggedness of the landscape, and uh, yeah, a lot of things that you intuitively think you know uh, this type of configuration is going to cause problems in the training process, and it will probably relate to a type of morphology that is more chaotic or more rugged, and then you know you confirm it in 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 the experiments, you know. Uh, so it is very interesting. And the example that you gave um, is, is, also, is also a great example. Things that you think that intuitively make sense, but that uh, when you see that empirically uh, is confirmed, uh, they really also give you a lot of confidence. Yeah. Absolutely, Javier. And just one other quick question, comment from my side before we go to the uh, Q&A from the, from the colleagues on the, on the webcast. Uh, so I, I found it very interesting, you know, when you talked about dropout. So as you mentioned, sort of that layer yes. that helps you make the model not overfit, but at the same time doesn't sort of get in the way of that convergence, get in the way of actually finding that uh, optimal set of parameters for the model. Yes. So very interesting to actually see that visualize. It's not so much a question, but a comment that when you describe, I mean, think about, you know, when we are optimizing for what is the right level of dropout, you typically use some kind of a non-visual metric. You just use some kind of a number to say, hey, it's, it's you know, yes. it's not, now it's actually impairing the ability of the model to convert. But when you actually showed those kind of peaks, which now intuitively makes sense visually that it'll get in the way of actually that sort of the classical example of the ball rolling downhill, well, there's a little block stopping the ball from going through. Uh, exactly. So that actually I found very fascinating, uh, Javier. Exactly. And, you know, and the, the interesting thing of this as well is that when you visualize, look at that layer of noise, you know, there are many different types of noise, right, in deep learning. One thing is the noise that may be created and the chaotic behavior when, you, for example, you have a very deep network without skip connections. So noise can be very positive or very negative. And to actually see the, the qualitative, uh, uh, you know, morphology of that noise layer, uh, it, it gives you a lot of information and it can also inspire new strategies to add noise to the networks in different ways to improve generalization as well. And by the way, I want to say that uh, from all of these experiments, there are a lot of insights taken from these experiments that at the moment are under study. As, as, as I was saying before, it is very complicated to analyze also the insights because you have to, uh, you know, correlate with many different types of networks and everything. But all of these visualizations uh, trigger many different types of hypotheses. And, and potentially, apart from confirming intuitions, uh, they can give ideas to, to try to reach uh, similar effects in different ways. Yes. Interesting. Javier, so the first question we have is, uh, is are there uses of lost networks for explainability, interpretability, transparency of the models and their predictions? Well, that is, a, that is a great, great question. Um, I think I think that there should be, there should be, um, but most of the most of the focus uh, at the moment is in relating the lost landscapes to the performance of the network, to the performance of the optimization algorithms. In terms of explainability, there hasn't been much. A effort in that direction to relate, uh, you know, the morphology and the dynamics of the lost landscapes. I think most of the effort is in in the performance, you know, in the uh, in the behavior of the network, in the levels of uh, uh, generalization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The explainability. This is a great question, actually. I, there hasn't been much in in that direction, you know, but I think it would be a very interesting direction to explore because there is such a emphasis nowadays on that topic. So thank you for the question. It will definitely make me think about Wait, it. We have another question. So do you envision the lost landscape becoming a common tool in the ML engineer or data scientist toolkit? And then what are the preconditions for this to become a reality? Yeah, yeah, I think I absolutely see this happening. Uh, now, the biggest problem is the computational requirements that uh, the lost landscape have. You know, They require a very, very large amount of computation. Uh, you know, I've, I've had to do a lot of work in, in optimizing these processes, but it still requires a lot of computation. So, but it would be, I think we will get there. 
I don't know when, but we will get there. But eventually, yes, it will be a wonderful tool because visualization has been a critical tool by you know the best geniuses in history uh, to complement their analytical and, and whatever numerical processes. People like Einstein used to work mainly with visualization. So you know, um, being able to have in your toolbox uh, the capacity to understand, uh, especially the morphology and the dynamics, you know, the change of, of the, 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 the structure of the loss function, the dynamics of it through the training processes would be invaluable. You know, it, it will be eventually. But we have that hurdle. Uh, we have that those computational requirements, and it is still going to take time. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember, Javier, one of your slides you talked about a technique where you were actually computing. You needed the full full Hessian, the the, the second order derivative matrix, and you know well, calculating that is basically theta n squared memory requirement. Yeah, so you that's cannot. One example. Yeah, you cannot actually. We cannot. You cannot actually use the full Hessian because of what you said. Because it is n, n square, you know. So instead of that, we what you use is we use the extreme eigenvalues as an right. approximation, you know. But you cannot actually work with a full Hessian. You can't in in networks with millions of parameters. Yeah. So we have another interesting question: Are landscapes of loss functions from the same class similar? And major evident differences from different classes? If yes, then can we leverage it to initialize better candidates for faster convergence? So when when uh, you talk about uh, from the same class, uh, you are referring from specifically. What do you mean by the same class or different classes? Okay, we'll uh, request them to clarify. Class of question. network? Is it different types of networks? Different uh, that's types what of I networks? thought. That, that's what I thought. But perhaps they can uh, clarify. Yeah, the it should be. It should be. It should be different types of networks. I guess. So um, yeah, I mean the lost landscape. A great example that we saw was the Gans. Okay, so a great example was the GANs. For example, the, the type of uh, landscape with the GANs uh, has a, quite of a different nature of morphology and dynamics. Um, but yeah, you know, you can see that even, even when you change different activation functions, like in the comparisons between ReLU and MISH, uh, you know, the morphology and, the, and the, you know, the conditioning of the landscape changes a lot. So, you know, the nature of the landscape changes even within the same class, within the same network, as you change the parameters, it can change dramatically. Like when you use skip connections or, or you don't use skip connections, the change can be dramatic in the landscape. So there is a lot of variation and, and that's why it's so critical an area of research because there is a lot of variation in the morphology and there is a lot of correlation with the performance. So understanding well these correlations is, is critical. Interesting. So this is a question close to what we just talked about, uh, uh, Javier. So uh, uh, oh, yeah. were there specific challenges associated with specific types of visualizations as opposed to just general challenges like you described with compute and memory and all that? Were there certain visualizations that had peculiar challenges as well associated with them? Mm, great question. And, and by the way, I want to say again that calculating the full Hessian is not something that is done. OK, what we do is to work with the, with the eigenvalues. OK. Um, I mean, a lot of challenges. The Lost Landscape project is full of challenges. The whole thing is a massive challenge. But uh, I would say that each project has different challenges, but the most difficult projects are the ones that involve dynamics and movement. You know? um, because first of all, you have to calculate a lot of different <laughs> landscapes for each of these visualizations, and that takes a very long time. And then you want to do experiments. I mean, what a lot of people don't see, when people see the visualizations of the project, they see the finished product. But before we reach the finished product, I've had to do a lot of different uh, tests, of course, at lower resolutions or whatever, you know. But all that process of experimenting uh, is um, is very complicated. It takes uh, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of uh, effort, and uh, that is the most complicated part, you know, the, the experiments that take uh, to the dynamic visualizations. And then the work with Gans was specifically quite complicated with Gans. Uh, because you are also dealing uh, with um, you know, the lost landscape. You have the critic and you have the generator, and uh, the network is way more temperamental. You know, so the guns are definitely challenging. For example, interesting. Uh, so this question we touched a little bit on compute. How about from a software stack perspective? Yes. Javier, you didn't mention exactly what kind of tools you used from a software yeah. perspective. Well, great question. I mean, basically it all goes down. You know, you can use whatever. You know, you can use. Uh, I mean, I work a lot with PyTorch. PyTorch, 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 all right. Uh, I've also used FastAI a lot, but this PyTorch, 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 and FastAI. But in terms of compute, it's summarized very, very quickly. GPUs, GPUs, GPUs. So, you know, uh, the computation just requires a lot of GPU power. 
And uh, in these visualizations, I have used all types of resources, resources, resources on the cloud, uh, you know, resources uh, in premises, but a combination of different GPUs. And uh, a lot of these visualizations, just for you to get an idea, have taken weeks to produce. Okay, some of them have taken many hours, some, some of them have taken days, some of them have taken weeks and weeks. So, and you know how it works. Uh, the more compute power, the more GPUs, the less time, but they still take a lot of time. So yeah, more and more GPUs. Very interesting. So here, uh, Javier, you had mentioned, you know, that you talked about a yes. very interesting concept of when you reduce dimensionality, you lose something, but certainly it's still very useful. So, so what is it that you actually lose when you do reduce dimensionality, understanding that it is still very useful? Yeah, okay, that is a great question. So if we go back to the phrase that you were mentioning before, Vic, if we consider that this uh, representation, the curvatures, are a weighted average of, of the curvatures in the high dimensional space, that already gives us the answer. I mean, we're seeing an average, basically, of the curvatures in the high dimensional space. So what will, be, I mean, we're losing two things. I mean, we're losing, obviously, detail because we're seeing an average of the distribution of the convexities and non-convexities. And then, of course, uh, we're losing what we lose in all dimensionality reductions. I mean, uh, is, is the flat line analogy that I gave. I mean, when we see things appear and disappear and then tunneling happens and boundaries melting, okay, this is the, this is the effect of the dimensionality reduction. The same thing that happens to a person living in a 2D world watching what happens in a 3D world. Okay, this is what we are also losing. We are losing to actually see all the continuity of all the movement in the, the in the millions of directions that actually exist in the high dimensional space that we cannot see. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, this is an interesting question as well. So will it be possible to visualize the optimization trajectory as well on that <laughs> landscape? Very that is a great question that I have answered already in a couple of articles. Uh, I, I love this question. So this is a great question. So as I explained in the talk, if you use PCA directions, you will be able to visualize the optimized part of the landscape, and you will be able to see all the variation in the trajectory of SGD. And by using PCA directions, you can plot. You can plot the trajectory, but the only part of the landscape that you're gonna see is the part of the gradient, is the part of the convexity. That's the problem. If you use the random directions, then you're gonna see all the richness, the convexities, the non-convexities, but then your random directions will be orthogonal. And let's remember the trajectory of SGD is very, very low dimensional. So the random directions are gonna be orthogonal to it. You're not gonna be able to see the variation. So this is what makes it at the moment a problem that is not solved. This is the answer. To be able to see both fully at the same time. You cannot yet at the moment. Okay, we, we haven't found a good uh, solution yet. Because when you see all the richness of the landscape, you cannot capture well all the variation of the trajectory. And when you see very well the trajectory, then you cannot see all the richness of the landscape. So that is the situation. Yeah. That's a, that's a great answer, Javier, because you know normally when you watch uh, simplified illustrations of how SGD works, you typically, it's always animated. It's basically a very nice like, yes. curve and you have the ball rolling. Exactly converges down at that base point. But I think it's very fascinating with your visualization. Someday it may very well be possible to have not a animation, well, an animation, but not a sort of uh, a creative animation, but actually a representation of the training process yeah. with, as Diganta mentioned, the actual trajectory being mapped of the optimizer. This would be wonderful. I mean, this would work. What I have done in, in, in many of my dynamic visualizations, what I can do, though, is to position the exact precise point where the minimizer is, the point in weight space, and in these visualizations, by the way, we are it's like we are riding on the shoulders of the minimizer, okay? We cannot see the entire space. So we are centered on the minimizer, and we're watching a range on weight space around that point. And as the minimizer moves during the training, we follow it, we ride on its shoulders, okay? So we can always see the, the exact position of the minimizer. But yeah, but we cannot... Uh, do the projection of both together. But in the future, it may be possible. This does why, I mean, for me, this is a, is a fascinating field because there is so much stuff ahead to, to explore. Yeah. Uh, this is a very interesting question as well around uh, floating points. So FP16 and FP32, have you done it with different precise precision floating points? Okay, Andres is a great friend of mine and, and a super expert in deep learning. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, I have done a few visualizations, but very few. So I have done some of the trainings 
to produce the data. I have just FP16, but very few, Andres, very few. This is, uh, by me at least, very unexplored. And uh, that, that's a great question because uh, maybe with different levels of precision, uh, we could see maybe something on the landscape related to that. And I haven't really explored that. So thank you, Andres. That's a great suggestion. Great. Uh, so Javier, just last question from my side, and yes. I know we're getting close and it's getting late for you as well. So we appreciate your time. So how, how do people engage with you? How do people that are interested in this work maybe work with you from a volunteer perspective, or they can maybe contribute some financial resources or maybe some compute or like what are the different engagement models for people to support you in this amazing venture? Yeah, uh, great question. So first of all, people that want to contact me, they can just contact me by email at uh, ideami at ideami.com. Also in the lostlandscape.com website is my contact as well. And in ideami.com, my main website as well. Now, in terms of uh, possibilities, uh, there are a lot of possibilities. Of course, working on these landscapes always requires, as we said, a lot of time and a lot of resources. So anybody that may be interested in yeah, providing more resources for uh, this project, uh, please contact me anytime because that will be very welcome because uh, this project really could be taken much further with more and more resources. That's one part. Then in terms of research, I'm, I'm very often contacted by researchers from different institutions, uh, yesterday from Stanford, uh, NYU, MIT, in different places. And, um, and yeah, they propose me ways of combining my pipeline because I haven't had much time to talk about the full pipeline because that would take very long time, okay? But the pipeline I have created, it combines all the engineering and, and you know, optimization parts with the creative and, and artistic parts and it's like a long pipeline. And they propose to combine my pipeline with the specific research they are doing. And, you know, if we see that uh, there are, there's potential in that, then, you know, we can strike collaboration. So, yeah, I invite people that, that can see potential of this, uh, of a combination of, of efforts to contact me as well. And um, likewise, for other types of uh, ideas that people may have, you know, to combine with the project. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Javier. It was a pleasure having you on this webcast. And we hope you'll come back in a couple of months to share some updates and uh, come back to our community with some amazing new uh, visualizations. And thank you for unveiling two visualizations on this presentation and look forward to keeping in touch with you and supporting your initiative. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Vic. I want to thank you as well for the opportunity. And uh, I also want to say just to close that this project is also a way of promoting in the deep learning community and in the technology community in general, uh, you know, blending all the analytical and, you know, uh, part of the, our communities with the, you know, the more uh, as well creative and, and artistic side and the visualization side. And I think I'm excited because it's an effort that I see more and more people getting involved in. And there are a lot of exciting times ahead. So thank you, Vic, for inviting me and all the best to all thank of you. Thank you, Javier. Bye for now. All the best.